awesome. I want to get into this really quickly. Last week I talked about how, uh, let's just pray. Jesus, we love you, we bless you, we honor you. God, I pray that you continue to, to open hearts this morning, to soften hearts. God, just receive that anything that you have for us, God, that we would receive it with openness and gladness this morning. And God, we just, we just declare, God, that your word would go forth and it would not return void. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Lift your hands out like this. Say, I receive everything that is from you. Amen. Amen. How many of you know if, you, if, if, if he's handing out something, you want it? Even if it's correction, or even if it's anything, if it's from Jesus, I want it. Right? If it's from him, I, I always want it. Amen? So I talked about how we, we, we deal with a lot of... Um, Last week I talked about how it's easy to read scripture and hear sermons and just leave church realizing where we don't measure up, right? We, we hear, we're confronted with scripture and then all we do out of that scripture, we read 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and we just hear, you know, love is patient, love is kind, love is this, and all we ever do truly is see like, man, I need to step it up. Instead of realizing that God is actually drawing us and giving us an invitation to take us deeper. He's not just trying to show you where you're not at. He's trying to draw you to where you need to be. Amen? There's a big difference because one can leave you defeated and not knowing how to get better. The other one leaves you empowered knowing and going in the right track. Amen? Amen. So I, was, I had a word recently. I was, I was praying about uh, a side of God that, that we need to understand, and it's the compassionate, merciful side of God. How many of you know there's a compassionate, merciful side of our God? And I think a lot of times, uh, I, I just find it uh, weird that in the church, a lot of times, we, we get so excited about hellfire and brimstone. And then we don't get moved about the compassion and mercy of our Jesus. And when we say like, oh yeah, buddy, if you don't sin, as sinners that they lay liars have their place in the lake of fire, we're like, amen. What in the world? Why are we celebrating the punishment of the wicked when I don't see God doing that? When the word says this, he says, I take no pleasure in the punishment of the wicked. I take no pleasure in the punishment of the wicked. And if we can go around without a tear in our eye, knowing that people are going to hell and need Jesus, then we have a wrong heart about it. Is it right? Thank you. Remember, we, we, we love the amen stuff that makes us feel good, right? But the reality is we should always amen truth, right? We should always say, man, that's good. That's a good word because that's, what, that's, a, that's a word from the Lord. And what we see is the Lord was just showing me, man, why do we get so excited? And we're like, man, well, one day, you know, uh, if you don't stop, they don't repent, you tell your kids, and some of our old parents are like, well, you don't stop smoking, you don't stop drinking, you're going to go to hell. And people are like, amen. It's like, whoa. I thought Jesus said to go and tell the good news. The bad news is that without Jesus, you're going to hell, right? That's the bad news. What's the good news? That God is so merciful, and in his mercy and in his compassion, he sent his only begotten son, that if you would believe in him, you have everlasting life. That's the good news. We should see that God, yes, he sits on a throne of justice and righteousness where he has to judge justly, but guess what? He has chose to send Jesus so he can show himself merciful. So he can give us grace. And I would like to tell you this morning that I think that we should get more excited about the mercy and grace of God than the damnation of what he's going to do at the end. I would love to see more people shouting that God's going to forgive sinners than he's going to punish sinners. What is wrong with us when we get so excited about hell? It's quiet in here. And start to stop to think that, man... Our God is full of mercy and compassion. I think we get this false picture of God from the Old Testament. And we look at the Old Testament and we're like, man, God has opened up the earth. He's killing people. He's bringing down fire. He's doing some crazy stuff. And you imagine like that in the New Testament, the disciples went to Jesus. They're like, hey, do you want us to send fire down from heaven and kill these people? They were just saying something they've seen before. And they're like, whoa, 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 what's going on here? And the reality is, I think in the church, that we have to truly check our hearts this morning. If we got people in our family who are lost and sick and dying of addiction or whatever else it is, and we're not moved with compassion, then we do not have the heart of Jesus for them. Because the heart of Jesus, like we, we sang earlier, that you stood outside my grave with tears still on your face. That's our Jesus. 
He hated sin. He hated death. He hated that sin controlled us, that death conquered us. But he came in and it made him weep. But then he calls our name. And he says, Lazarus, come out of that grave. Maddie, come out of that grave. OJ, come out of that grave. And we see the merciful compassion of our God. We look at the cross of Jesus Christ. And what we should see is an emblem of just mercy and compassion and grace of our God. And we should not get so excited and celebrate that people are going to hell. Right? And I don't know where that came from. And I believe a lot of times it's used, a lot of, I don't to be honest with you. When you saw God being, or Jesus being harsh, he was being harsh with Pharisees, with religious people. When you saw him being tender and, and kind is when he was with the broken prostitutes and the lowly. Right? And so what is this exactly? I think that we, we need to check our hearts, church. We need to check and see, man, because I'm going to tell you, I, I've been through seasons in my life where there's been people in my life that bother me and get on my nerves so much that I get to, my heart gets hardened towards them, right? And we're, we all get there. We might have some people in our lives right now that have hardened our hearts. And the last, then you got one person who started it, and you got another person who built on it. Guess what? The devil doesn't give up of trying to harden in your heart. He wants to get it to the hardest place. He wanted one person to start it, and then he wants to continue to build on it. He'll continue to send as many people problems into your life if he knows that you're going to keep hardening your heart. Because when you harden your heart, you'll start to lose compassion and you'll start to lose mercy for people. And you don't even realize it. And an easy, easy way to see if your heart is hardened is that you're not excited about the presence of Jesus. You, you don't have a heart for worship. You don't want to get out and, and give him praise because he's worthy and honor because your heart has just been so hard and broken and you're, you're putting up a wall and I think that we need to check ourselves and say, man, am I being merciful? Am I being like our God? Am I, am I being full of compassion for people? And I'm going to tell you, there's a season in my life where I had one in particular person that drove me crazy. And I would come home and I would tell my wife and I would say, honey, I don't even care that this person is lost. Because they think they're saved, this person I'm talking about. And I said, I don't even care. I said, my heart is so bitter right now. I said, because I don't have any compassion for this person. And I remember, my, obviously, my wife's like, well, that's not good. I'm like, yeah, I know it's not good. <laughs> I know that's not good, right? But I remember I had to start praying, God, would you soften my heart to love like you? To not just see wicked people and wicked things, God, and just not have compassion on them and compassion on them. To just think, oh, they're going to get what they deserve. And you see people get arrested. You see people get arrested for things and see people go to jail. And we love, um, listen, we all get up in arms about people. People are killing people. People are doing absurd things to children and whatever else. Can those people still be forgiven? I would like to propose that maybe we're a lot different than our God. Maybe he has a type of forgiveness and compassion and mercy, it is something that's really hard for us to walk in, right? And we need him to actually help us and to show us how to love like he loves. Because it's easy for us to get stuck and not be forgiving and not be compassionate and be bitter and be harsh towards people, amen? It's easy, right? I know it's easy. And I remember it was eight months in, I was praying. You know what I started doing? I said, God, soften my heart towards these people. Soften my heart towards this person in particular. And I remember one day, I was working, and I remember this, in particular, this particular person came walking by, beside me, and for the first time in eight months, I began to cry down my face at work. And I finally saw this person how the Lord saw him. He had compassion on him. He had mercy for him. And he just needed Jesus like I need Jesus. And I thought, man, <laughs> and it took me a while to get there. I prayed a long time. My wife was praying for me. She's like, yeah, you need help. You know, you're supposed to be a youth pastor at a church. You can't go around you're just having your heart bitter towards people like that. I'm like, you're right. It's hard. Without Jesus, it is. Without his spirit in us, helping us and pulling us, that we would see broken, we would see people doing this wrong, and we would continue to have mercy and compassion. Amen. We would see people on Owensboro Times, whatever this garbage is, and doing horrible things, and we would be moved to tears. 
And we'd be moved to prayer. And we'd be moved to our knees. And we would cry out to God for an awakening of our city. Instead of holding up our arms saying, yep, I tried to tell them to come to church. But they wouldn't listen. My goodness. I thought the church was supposed to go to them. Right? And so I see something different in Hosea. Go to Hosea chapter 11. Verse 1. If you have your Bible, if you have a smartphone. Heathens. Verse 1, it says this. If we could put that up, that'd be cool. Hosea 11. There we go. It says, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burn, or burning offerings to idols. Yet, I, yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. Number one, you get to understand something, that our God is a loving, merciful, compassionate Father. He's a, this is Old Testament. He's a loving, how many of you know that God's first move is mercy? His last move is judgment. That's the last thing on the list if you read the Bible. The white throne of judgment seat is the last thing that God is trying to do. His first thing he's trying to do is get a hold of people with compassion and mercy and grace. That's his first move. God is a loving father. And listen to this though. He's a loving father with disobedient children. Can I get an amen? Hey, God knows what it's like to have disobedient children. Right? Right? Sometimes we're like, man, God, don't, he didn't have my kids. They, <laughs> the tribe of Benjamin, they don't know nothing about my toddlers, right? He said, I've done so much for you and still you disobey. How many parents can we can relate? I've done so much for my children. I feel like I've lined everything out for them and still they disobey. Right? We're like, man, like what's wrong with you? And God knows the same exact type of feeling. And he says, man, I know this. And this is what's crazy. There's so much God has done for us that we don't even realize or acknowledge him for. Listen to what he said in that last verse. He said, I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I would like to propose this morning that there are so many things that God is doing in your life we're not giving him credit for. That you don't see that that little, that job that you got, you don't see that all your bills being taken care of. You don't see that them, your marriage getting a little better. You're not, you're not seeing that your car hasn't broke down. All kinds of little things that we're not acknowledging him for. And he said that I've healed them and they didn't even know that I healed them. How many things are you passing by in your life and we're not even acknowledging him for? Maybe you've been working at the same job for 30 years and you're blessed and you've never thought to step back and acknowledge the Lord and say, wow, God, I, I thank you for this job. Man, my kids are healthy. They might be little hellions, but they're healthy. Amen. God, I, is there, how many of you know there's always something to acknowledge the Lord for? Every single morning, when the devil tries to get you frustrated and he tries to get you just noticed, or, uh, focused on all the things that are going wrong, I encourage you to start to acknowledge Jesus in that moment. God, I thank you that you're here. God, I can't think of anything going right in my life, but I can think of when you came and saved me. I can think of when you filled me with the Holy Ghost. I can, I can think of, God, that you shed your blood for me. I acknowledge you right now. I acknowledge that I'm here. I acknowledge that I'm alive. I acknowledge that I'm in good health, God. I acknowledge that you hear my prayers. He said, I healed you, but you did not know that I healed you. I believe that we need to start trying to recognize what God is orchestrating in our lives that we're not giving him credit for. Your business is thriving. Your, your job is thriving. Maybe you graduated with a bunch of different degrees. God probably gave you that intellect. He's given you wisdom. Start to acknowledge the Lord for it. You made it out of a program, start to acknowledge the Lord for it. You didn't go to prison, instead went to a program, start to acknowledge the Lord for it. He's saying, I, I've done so much for you, and they don't even know. And I find that convicted me like crazy. I'm like, man, that is so true. Because all the enemy wants us to focus on are all the things that we think God's not doing. We get so focused on what he's not doing, and we, it takes our praise away from what he's doing. Or what he's done. Right? I can, man, I have a song that says, uh, what does it say? I'm alive. Is that, is that the first song we sing? Oh, how's it go? Yeah, he came, I knew that you would come. And it goes, and I'm, a, I'm afraid to see your face. Keep going. I'm alive. There we go. That's the part I was getting at. And I was literally thinking, I don't know about you, but I've been in many near-death situations. So just this simple thing of not even being born again, but literally being alive. Amen. How many of you know that everybody in this room is alive? 
Maybe we should acknowledge God for the simple things we think. Well, I didn't get that new job. Well, you're alive, aren't you? There's breath in your lungs. God has purpose for your life. He still wants to use you. It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. God can use you just like he can use anybody else. All you got to do is be empty and be willing. Let's go to verse 4. He said, I led them with cords of kindness, with bands of love, and I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws, and I bent down to them and fed them. So God leads us with love. And then the Bible says, in the New Testament, it says that he, he draws us with what? Loving kindness to repentance. How does he draw us with repentance? Loving kindness. I don't know about you, but when I, I, I sin and I do stupid things, I, I didn't tell you, there's so many times that before I got married, I was doing some stupid things, some sinful things. And I remember I would get so discouraged to come down front. I used to be right down here and I'd come and worship the Lord. Yeah, anybody remember that? I was new in this church and I'd be right down here worshiping the Lord. And the enemy would try to convince me not to go to church, not to lift my hands and not to do anything because I've been screwing up sinfully. And I would always come no matter what. And I'm going to tell you right here at this altar that God would draw me with bands of love. He would pour out his love and his presence on me like I never had before. And it would just break me to pieces. He would not, when I came down this altar and I've been screwing up, he did not come out here like this. That's right, you better be down here. Mm-hmm. You better repent, son. No, I believe that he came down here and he, he wrapped his arms around me and gave me a huge hug. And just held on to me. And I remember I was like, man, how merciful and gracious is our God that he draws us with bands of love. He draws us with his loving kindness. And in that moment, it made me want to stop sinning. Him standing over me like this. See what you've done, boy? That just makes me feel ashamed of myself. It makes me want to give up. But when I see him look me and hold my head up high and say, I love you, I still love you, it moves me. And I want you to know this morning, if you've been going down the wrong path and you've been doing crazy, stupid things, God's saying, lift your head. He's saying, I still love you. He's saying that your sin never stopped me to begin with. What makes you think it stops me now? Did you hear me? Look what he did to conquer sin. Listen, we get so screwed up thinking that after we get saved and we mess up, now God doesn't love us. Look how screwed up you were before you got saved. Right? And if you don't know what you were screwed up before you got saved, you need to understand that this morning. You might not have been a drug addict, but you were still screwed up, amen? But he draws us with love. He draws us with his bands of love. He, he comes with compassion, amen? And I think that if you're trying to reach your children, listen, if you're trying to reach your children, it's not going to come, or grandchildren or whatever, and you're trying to get them to come to church, it's not going to come from pointing fingers and making them feel like garbage and reminding them that hell's a real place. I knew hell was a real place because I was raised in church. But I tell you what saved me, but I'm telling you what drew me, it was the loving kindness of God. His love found me. And I knew I didn't deserve it. And I knew I wasn't worth it, but I knew he looked over me and said, no, you're worth it. This is the point of the Bible. This is the gospel. This is the good news. This is the mercy and grace of God. Amen? So I believe he wants us to do the same. I believe he wants us to draw people with compassion. Let's go to verse 5. He says, they shall not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria shall be their king because they have refused to return to me. So listen, it is not our sin that keeps us away from God. It is our refusal to repent of sin. Did you hear me? It is not your sin that keeps you away from God. I mean, obviously at the beginning, your sin separated. You don't hear what I'm not saying. But it's not your sin that keeps you. Did you ever notice in the Bible, he would always say, return to me. Return. He, he would never say, oh, you're too far. He said, you return. Come to me. Even then, when we're about to read in a moment, people say, well, no, he finally gave it up. No, listen, God always had a remnant of his people. He never completely destroyed them. He always did. We'll see that here in a moment. But listen, it's not your sin that will keep you from him. It's your lack of repentance that will keep it from him. So if you sin, praise God that he paid the price for your sin. Repent and move on. Instead of sitting there thinking, oh, crap, I just sinned again. Oh, man, I'm still the same. And you start to profess all these things that are not biblical. I'm still the same person. That's not true. You're a new creation. You've been born again. And there's something that changes when you start to declare who you really are in this new life with Jesus. And we start to say, so listen, if you fall short, if you sin, repent. Just it's that simple. The Bible says in James, Confess your sin one to another and pray for each other that you may be healed. If you don't have someone in your life 
that you confess your sin to? I would say, are we being disobedient to that verse? The problem is, is that we don't actually know each other well enough to actually trust each other because we just play church. And we're scared to actually tell someone our sin because we're scared they're going to take it somewhere else. Right? Is that just me? I have people in my life, I know it's true. How about, I believe that God is moving us to compassion and mercy for one another. That when somebody comes down to you in this church and they say, I've been doing the craziest things, you're going to have compassion and mercy for them. Not judgment and guilt and shame. When your kids come to you and they say, Dad, I just did this. Mom, I just did this. Whatever it is, you're going to start to learn how to have compassion and mercy. It doesn't mean they're not going to be disciplined, but it means that you move in discipline with a different heart. That's a good word. Because it's all the difference when your heart is fixed on reconciliation, your heart is fixed on restoration. God's heart is fixed on restoration. His heart is fixed on reconciliation. And you see that when he says, just, listen, if you sin, don't make it a big deal. Just repent. It's already been purchased. And bought. Don't run from God like Adam and Eve, right? We sin and we want to go do the same thing they did. We want to run and hide ourselves, Right? And I love what God said to Adam. He said, they said, I'm naked. He said this. He said, who told you that? Who told you that you lacked something that you already have? And that's what the devil does. He comes in after you get born again, and he tells you that you're not really saved. You're not, you still lack things. You're still screwed up. It's not true. Verse 6, the Lord shall rage against their cities, consume the bars in their gates, and devour them because of their own counsels. My people are bent on turning away from me, and though they call out to the Most High, I shall not raise them up at all. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? Here's the merciful part of God. How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Edmah? How can I treat you like Zeboam? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute in my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am a God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. Our God is a merciful God. He says, my heart recalls in me. He says, like your parents did when you were a kid. They say, oh, this hurts me more than it hurts you. You're like, yeah, right. Right? That's what God is saying. He said, my heart burns within me to, to discipline you. And he's saying, I won't cut you out completely. But he's saying that there, there has to be when we, when we screw up and do that, God wants to discipline us and correct us in love with mercy and kindness. Because he wants us to grow and go deeper and get into the best place. I remember I had this job that I hated. And I got saved. And, uh, and I remember praying and praying and praying. Can the worship team come, please? I remember praying and praying and praying. Like, God, will you change this? Please. And I was like, man, and, and I worked for a year and a half after that, actually. And I, I guess the answer was, no, son, keep, get to work. And, and I was like, is there something better? I need something better. And the Lord finally spoke to me after about a year there. He said, I've done, I've done things in your heart and in your life that I could have never done if I would have gave you a better job. Some of us, we need to stop thinking and asking God to take us out of things that actually he's got us in to grow us and mature us. Stop asking God to take you out of a church that he has you in actually to grow you and mature you. And we're trying to refuse it, right? Because <laughs> it gets tough. I love this last thing. I'm just going to touch on this and we're done. He said, God said, I am, I am God and not a man. And I'm going to talk to you. Charles Spurgeon talks about some differences between us and God. Ready? About forgiveness and how he's merciful. Man, being us, cannot hold back his anger very long. Man cannot bear with others when he is tired, stressed, or annoyed. Right? We have a hard time. How many times do you, you find yourself, people are like, man, I, the kids are being crazy, and you've already had a rough day, and you almost find this excuse of like, man, I've already had a rough day. I, I, I can't deal with this. We have a hard time when we're already stressed and annoyed to show compassion and mercy. But let me tell you right now, God doesn't. God's not up there annoyed with us. When you keep making mistakes over and over again like your kids do, and we all know that it drives us nuts as parents, God is up there and it doesn't drive him nuts. He still has compassion. He still has mercy. He's not like us. He's holy. He's perfect. It says this, man will not reconcile if the person who offended him is a person of bad character. We have a hard time reconciling with people who have bad character, right? God doesn't. But we struggle with that, right? But he doesn't. 
Man is often willing to be reconciled if the offending party craves forgiveness and makes the first move. Well, you offended me, so you need to say sorry to me. And you need to come find me out. God isn't like that. God made the first move. When we were yet sinners, He died for us. So He doesn't struggle with some of these things like we struggle with. Man is often willing to be reconciled if the offending party will never do it again. How many of us, if we would be honest, we're like, I forgive you, but you can't ever do that again to me. Right? That's not our God. That's not Jesus. He's not, he doesn't put stipulations on His forgiveness, on His mercy, on His compassion. He literally is like, hey, you're probably going to screw this up again, and I'm still going to love you. You're probably going to continue to screw it up, and I'm still going to love you. And we struggle with that, right? Because we're, we're still, we still have a flesh, right? I love this part. It says, man, check this out. When he does reconcile, he does not lift the former offender to a place of high status and partnership. We definitely, if somebody's offended us and somebody's done us wrong or we think of somebody being evil, we're definitely not trying to reconcile and then give them a high level of friendship and a high level of partnership. When's the last time somebody screwed you over and you went and made it right with them and actually asked them to partner with you in business? That's what Jesus does. He says, yeah, you've screwed me over. Yeah, you've done all this, but guess what I'm going to do? I'm actually going to pick you up and I'm going to place you in a seat of honor. I'm going to place you in a high seat that you don't deserve. And then even more than that, Jesus will come and say, and the things I've done, you'll do greater things. Man. That's the compassion, that's the love, that's the mercy of our God. That's the forgiveness of our God. Amen, mama. Come on, I'm preaching better than y'all are amen in this morning. Listen, if God's, if he's convicting you this morning, he's, crawl, he's calling you higher, he's calling you. Maybe some of you just need to repent. You need to lay things down to God for, you have a hard heart. You need to just give it to Jesus this morning, whatever it may be. We'll have a moment for you to respond. Check this out. Man will not restore an offender without a period of probation. Okay, I forgive you, but it's gonna be a while before I really like you again. You're gonna have to prove yourself to me. God doesn't do that. God doesn't say, oh, you screwed up, now guess what, for the next seven months, you're gonna have to prove yourself. No. If you got people in your life that've been screwing up, don't put them on probation. Put them in line with mercy and grace and compassion and watch how they explode into who God called them to be. Watch how you see people step into what God, watch how you see your children step into who God has called them to be. When you stop pointing the finger or whatever and you continue to give them compassion and mercy, it doesn't mean you don't discipline, but you do it with the right heart. Man will not love, adopt, honor, and associate with one who has wronged him. God does all of those things and he does them really, really well. Amen. Man, we have all wronged the Lord. Amen. But in his mercy and his kindness and his compassion, he's gone above and beyond. And I believe that as his church, we should be the same way. We should go above and beyond with forgiveness and compassion and mercy. The Bible says this, if you don't forgive, there won't be any forgiveness for you. Because basically God is saying, how dare you not forgive someone? And as we're in this Christmas season, a lot of family problems and a lot of family junk comes and we're trying to, we gotta meet with some relatives that we don't like or whatever. And God's saying, how dare you withhold forgiveness when I never withhold it from you? How dare you withhold forgiveness when you were yet a sinner, I died for you. When you were lost completely, when you were addicted, when you were afflicted, when you were prideful, I never held it against you. And how dare us try to hold it for others. He's calling us to move in compassion and mercy. Can we stand? Our prayer team come. We just close our eyes in this room. Close our eyes. I just want you to focus there just for a moment.
just put your hand on your heart. Just say, heart, be soft in Jesus' name. Help me to forgive. Come on, everybody in this room, help me to forgive. I just want you to take a moment, just reflect on everything you just heard. If you've been far from the Lord, He loves you. He's a merciful God. He draws you with bands of love and kindness. Father, we just bless you right now. We thank you for what you're doing in our house, Jesus. We thank you for this place, God. Soften hearts right now in Jesus' name. Listen, if you need prayer for anything at all, if you need healing in your body, if you need just to come to the altar and spend some time with Jesus, if you need to give your life over to Jesus, I want you just to go ahead and leave your seat and come now. If you just want somebody to pray with you about anything, your marriage, whatever, I want you just to go ahead and come before you leave. If you just need to respond in any way, just go ahead and come right now. Grab the person beside you, everybody in this room, and say, do you need prayer? If they say yes, why don't you just bring them down here if they don't feel comfortable coming alone. Come on. Jesus, we just love you. We bless you. We honor you in this place. I pray, God, that you would just move with compassion and mercy on us, God, that we would go after people with compassion and mercy like you do, Father, that you draw us with bands of love, Lord. Father, I thank you so much for Friends of Sinners. God, I thank you for these families represented here today. We thank you for our church. Lord, I pray, God, that you would bless them and keep them and make your face to shine upon them and give them peace. In Jesus' mighty name, and all God's people said, one more time, and all God's people said, amen. Bless you. If you need prayer before you leave, you're welcome to continue to come down here or see the altars. If you need prayer for anything, please, uh, as you come before you leave. Also, if you've got some help, I could use you in the fellowship hall. We'll see you tonight at 6 o'clock.